chapter and one that we're going to find is very important in the scheme of things. You know, one of the things that is very clear from the very outset of Scripture is that there's always been two lines, the two seeds, the two ways of thinking, the two ways of behaving. There's been truth and error, sin and righteousness, once sin entered the world. It's always been the case. The problem is that the brighter <coughs> side of that equation has invariably given away to the darker side. The, the righteousness has been swamped by the iniquity. That's happening today, isn't it? Not only in our world, generally in society, but it's happening to the brotherhood of Christ. So we need to be on our guard that this doesn't swamp us because it happened before the flood and that was one of the reasons for the divine judgments that were brought in the deluge that swept away two billion plus people. So here are the two seeds from the creation to the flood. We have the line of the serpent over here that came through the eldest of Adam and Eve, Cain, the first murderer. And his family included a very notable gentleman, or I shouldn't use that term in relation to Lamech, because he was no gentleman, who was the beginning of a way of life that has corrupted society ever since. He was the man who was the first polygamist and his sons were the inventors of all the sorts of things that we see happening in our world today. We won't go into the details of that now except to say this, that Lamech claimed to be the seed of the woman. He was in the line of the serpent but he claimed to be the seed of the woman. You aware of that? I want you to have a look at Genesis chapter 4. He has, of course, two wives. And the time comes for him to boast to his two wives about two things. He says this in verse 23 of Genesis chapter 4. And Lamech said unto his wives, Now most of you in your Bible will not have a comma after the word wives. She's put one there. And what follows is is his statement. You know, you could read that this way. And lay next it under his two wives, Adar and Zillah, and then inverted commas, hear my voice. No, it should be this way. And lay next it under his wives, comma, Adar and Zillah. So he's making a call for these two women. Why would he do that? He does it because he wants to make a boast in two areas. It says this, Hear my voice, ye wise of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. Now, why wouldn't they hearken unto his speech? Why does he make that statement? Well, he makes that statement because of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God turns to Eve. She had been first in the transgression to use the words of the Apostle Paul. And what had been Adam's problem? For he is blamed for the entry of sin into the world, even though his wife was first in transgression. In verse 17, God says this to Adam. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. That's how he starts the curse upon man. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And Lamech saying, I won't make Adam's mistake. I'm too righteous for that. I'm not a fool like him. Hagar and Zillah, hear my voice. Hearken to my speech. I won't make his mistake. See what he's saying? He's boasting that he's much better than Adam. That's his first boast. What's his second? For I have slain a man to my wounding, he says in verse 23, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, Seventy and sevenfold. You know, he's actually quoting from Genesis 3.15. See, what I'm suggesting to you is that though we have two lines, this line, the apostate, the sinful line, the serpent line, not only understood the truth in its basic elements, they had twisted and distorted it, and they misused it. They made false claims about it. 
and Lamech claims to be the seed of the woman. How do I know that? We'll read what he says. I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Now that's translated by a rather hand this way. For a man have I slain in dealing my wounds, yea, a youth in smiting my blows. The RSV says, I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. So who had authority from God to kill in the promise of Genesis 3.15? Who was given the authority to kill? <coughs> well, the seed of the woman. Because we are told in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He, as it should read, shall bruise thy head. That's killing them, killing the serpent. And thou, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. That's only a wound, isn't it? A temporary wound. So what's Lamech saying? I'm the seed of the woman. I'm authorised to kill. And I kill others who wound me. So he's put it around the other way, you see. He's now saying that this line over here, which he <coughs> represents, is actually the seed of the woman line. That this line over here, they're all mixed up. They're actually the serpent line. Now this would never happen, would it? We'd never have a situation where people who are in the serpent line would say that we who are in the truth line are actually serpent. That would never happen, would it? Well, I think you can see where I'm coming from. And what happens is that this is how the truth is undermined and destroyed when people get mixed up. And this man makes wild claims which are not true. And some people over here on the other side believe it. Now, we know that Enoch didn't believe it because in Jude, we are told that Enoch stood up when he heard this speech of Lamech, he stood up and said, You are not the seed of the woman. And the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for all their ungodly speeches. And he goes on like that for half an hour. And so Lamech is after Enoch and so God has to snatch him away and put him somewhere else so he doesn't have to suffer murder at the hands of this man who falsely claims to have authority from God to kill him. So Enoch died somewhere else, away from the grass of Lamech for that reason. But that wasn't the end of the story because there were people on this side who lost sight of who they were and apostasy came and that's why God sent the flood to save only one family out of that mess. Because people on this side who had the heritage of the truth couldn't argue properly against the people on that side who were the seed of the serpent. So this was the, uh, the outcome. And we've been talking about the aftermath of this overflowing with water in which the whole world perished except for eight souls. You know, I start there because what we have in front of us here in this session is an expansion of the principles we've just been talking about. Now, put this up again. This is the structure of the section of Scripture that we're considering over the weekend. I put it up because I want you to see again that Genesis chapter 10, which has just been read out to us, in fact, should, if we were doing this strictly chronologically, it should sit down here under Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, which speaks about the rebellion of Nimrod and the building of the Tower of Babel. Because it was a, as a result of the building of the tower that God sent the angels, they confused the tongues of the builders, and they were divided into 70 nations. 70 different t tongues came out of that. And of course those 70 are spelled out in Genesis chapter 10. And we will see the details of that. So... We're going to consider the outcome of this building of the Tower of Babel, the rebellion of Nimrod. In the beginning of his kingdom, we are told in Genesis 10 verse 10, was Babel, Babylon, the confusion of the tongues, and Erech and Achad and Kalna, the land of Shinar. Now we're going to talk about those places and a lot more in the session tonight. It's going to be a bit, <coughs> a bit easier in this regard, that <coughs> whereas you have to have thinking caps on in a moment for the next... Uh, 40 minutes or so. Tonight it's basically just going to be a review of history of how all the platforms for what we see today in the Catholic Church 
and its harlot daughters and all the things that are undermining the truth were all back there. Genesis 10 and 11. More of that later. But here's the man who's responsible for it. Not all of it, because as we're going to see, Cush, his father, was ultimately responsible. Nimrod was the perpetrator. He was the man who set out to rebel against Yahweh 100 years after the flood. That's all it took. 100 years. And they rebelled against Yahweh and built the tower. And we'll see the reasons for that a little later on. Now Nimrod happens to be the 13th generation from Adam. You can count down here. Adam, Cain, Enoch. First uh, city is named after him, of course. Irad, Mahujael, Methusael, Lamech. This is the one I've just been talking about, referred to in Jude, verse 14. Though not by name. Three generations after him to the flood, to Noah. Then you've got Ham, and you've got Cush, and you've got Nimrod. So you count down. Nimrod is the 13th generation from Adam. Accident, do you think? No. His name means the rebel or we will rebel. And 13 is the biblical number for rebellion. And there are many places that you can use to demonstrate that. So here we've got the man who built this tower. Now this particular um, painting of the Tower of Babel is nonsense. This is Peter Bruegel's fanciful concept of the Tower of Babel. And I'll talk more about that later on tonight. The Tower of Babel looked nothing like that. It was actually a ziggurat. You know what a ziggurat is? It's got a four-sided tower, not this round building. But that's interesting because we're going to find tonight that that's exactly the shape in which the European Parliament has been built. So let's come and have a look now at Genesis chapter 10. Let's take the easy part first and then we'll enter into the more difficult part. There are 70 nations mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 that emanate from Shem, Ham and Japheth. Now here's the summary. As we read down through there, and Jason read these names very well in Genesis chapter 10, in verses 2 to 5, we have 14 nations listed from Japheth. In verses 6 to 20, we have 30 nations that come from Ham. And in verses 21 to 32, we have 26 nations that emanate from Shem. Now, these are not all the children of Shem, Ham and Japheth. These are not all the descendants. We're going to see that when we come to look at Shem. Yahweh's been very selective in, in picking certain names and leaving others out. Because it's quite deliberate, this. Now, some of you in this room will have done this exercise. You will have heard someone say that there are 70 nations mentioned in Genesis 10. And you will have said, well, I'm not just going to take his word for it. I'm going to go do an exercise. I'm going to actually prove that this is the case. Well, I'm like that. I hear someone say it, and I want to prove it. So I've done this exercise. And there's a key to it. If you count the names only once, and omit Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth in the exercise, and the names of cities that are mentioned, you'll find that there's 70. It's pretty simple to come to that conclusion. 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, 26 from Shem. Can you see something unusual about that? If you look at the world today, who is the most dominant of Noah's sons in terms of the overspreading of the population? Shapheth. He's only got 14. All right, isn't that interesting? So you see, the prophecy that was made about Japheth, that God shall enlarge the enlarger, is against the odds. Really, it's against the odds. But that's the way God works, isn't he? He doesn't care about the odds. If he says he's going to enlarge, he enlarge it. That's what happens. Prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. So there are 70 nations here. And we saw this, this illustration, Japheth in the north, Shem in the, in the area of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and Ham basically in, in uh, northern Africa, <coughs> and in the land of Canaan, of course. And we saw that that was brought about in Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19, uh, by the, by the uh, setting forth of the sons of Noah into their new habitat. Now, a modern scholar has traced all existing languages to three original sources, says Edersheim in one of his books, which is interesting, isn't it? That you can actually trace all the languages, and that's what we're talking about here, because Genesis 10 is listing off the 70 languages. That's why there are 70 of them. So when God confused the tongues of the builders of the tower 
They ended up with 70 tongues, different languages, but they could all be traced, they say, back to the three sons of Noah. Now, that's the easy part. Let's come to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 21. And I want you to actually address in your mind this question that I ask here on the screen. Let me just read to you verse 21 again. This is the beginning of the list of the, of the nations that emanated from Shem. It says, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. So why does it say that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber? Now, if you have a look down this list, you come down to verse 25, it says, And unto Eber were born two sons. So Eber is well down the list. In fact, when you count down, Eber is number 11 in the list of the progeny of Shem that are here mentioned. All right? You don't include Shem himself. Count down. Eber's number 11. Okay? So why would, why would God say that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber? That's a, that, yeah, there are answers to this, Mike, and we'll see the answer very plainly in a moment. But what I'm saying to you is this, that when we read our Bible and we come across statements like that that simply don't fit or seemingly don't fit, they don't, it doesn't seem right, you have to think about it. Because God's actually saying, I'm not, I, he doesn't make mistakes. I'm not putting that in there because I want you to pick up my mistakes. I don't make mistakes. If I make that statement, I make it for a reason. I want you to think about it. There has to be an answer then. And of course there is an answer. Now Eber, the name Eber, is from the root Eber. It's pretty clear, ain't it? And it means a cross on the opposite side. It's from the primary root, Abar, which means to cross over. It's used widely in any transition, and it occurs 29 times in Joshua chapter 1 through Joshua 4 of Israel, passing over the Jordan. They Abarred the Jordan. They crossed over. In Genesis 14 verse 13, Abraham is called Abram the Hebrew. He's an Eberite. Because Hebrew comes from this root, Eber. Abram the Eberite. A descendant of Eber. Now you're beginning to see, aren't you? You're beginning to see why God says that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber. He's talking about a special class of people. Crosses over. Eberites. Hebrews. And Abraham is the first one that crosses over. God calls him out of the darkness of Ur the Chaldees and he crosses over eventually from Haran, the Euphrates, to come into the land of promise where there are the descendants of who? Ham. Who worship what? Baal. Who's Baal? Bel. Who's Bel? Cush, the father of Nimrod. More about that tonight. So you begin to see what God's about here. He's about reversing what Nimrod accomplished in the building of the Tower of Babel where they all began with one speech, one lip, one... They all had the same religion, in other words. Originally they all had the same religion, but it had been, been apostatised. It had been twisted. And because they twisted it and they built them a tower to build themselves a name, God says, right... And he confuses their tongues and scatters them into 70 nations. And then he says, right, I'm going to take one man, Abraham, from Ur of the Chaldees, and I'm going to start the process to unwind what Nimrod accomplished in the dividing of the nations. And that's where we're going to end up in our study tomorrow morning. We're going to end up in that matter of God reversing the work of Nimrod. So that's why, you see, this is the beginning of the process. And God is making this statement that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber, the Hebrews, <coughs> the crosses over. 
Now, this is interesting. A Muslim historian of the 13th century, so 700 years ago, Abu Al-Fida, relates the story that the patriarch Eva, an ancestor of Abraham, was allowed to keep the original tongue, Hebrew in this case, because he would not partake in the building of the Tower of Babel. You know that? So the reason that this man, Eva, kept the Hebrew tongue, which is Yahweh's tongue, this is the lip that they all had originally. When they came out of the ark, they all spoke the same language. Hebrew. God's language. hundred years later, it's confused. Why? Because of the building of the Tower of Babel. But one man retains the Hebrew language. His name is Eva. Interesting, isn't it? And out of him comes Abraham. So you can see what God was doing here. The reward for not participating in the Tower of Babel was the keeping of the original divine tongue of Hebrew. Now, let's have a look at the patriarchal line after the flood, because it reveals some very interesting facts. Now, for those of you who are keen students of chronology, let me just state this, that I've actually used Brother Thomas's chronology of the life of Abraham, which is a little bit different, and you do get some different outcomes if you use the so-called standard chronology, but Brother Thomas's chronology of Israel, I haven't seen any reason to abandon it, so I've used that, and it does bring some very interesting outcomes. Now we have here the deluge. This is the flood. Noah, of course, was 600 years of age at the flood. He died at, uh, when he was 950, which is quite a lengthy uh, life, isn't it? 950 years. So he lived 350 years after the flood. His son Shem lived uh, for 600 years. Of course, he was uh, reasonably young, probably about 100 years of age. Uh, so he lived considerably after the flood. I noticed David smiling at 100 years being young, but it was in those days. <laughs> Arphaxad lived for 438 years. He was born after the flood. Of course, this is the line of, of Shem uh, that we're following here, the patriarchal line. Salah and Eva. So here's the man we call the, the Hebrew. Uh, Peleg and Ru and Sirach and Nahor, Terah and Abram. Okay? Now, there was a hundred years after the flood that Nimrod's rebellion began. That was the time when the, the, the nations were divided. And that's why this arrow here is pointing to Peleg. I want you to notice what it says in verse 25 of Genesis 10. And unto Eber were, two, were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now we're going to see in a moment that the dividing of the earth is actually a reference to the confusing of the tongues. The separating of the sons of men by the confusing of their tongues. That's what it means when it says, in his days was the earth divided. So Peleg was born at the time when the angels came down and confused their language. A new baby's born. And his father said, well, look, we've got this new situation. We've got 70 different tongues. We don't understand each other. So he named his son Division, Peleg, because that's what happened at his birth. Now that's really highly significant, as you'll see in a moment. Well, let's just have a look at some of these interesting facts here. When you look at this patriarchal line, so let's have a look at the death of Noah. Who was who was alive at the death of Noah? Well, Shem, obviously, uh, Faxet, Salah, Eva. Peleg had died before Noah, and these two boys, Nahor had died before Noah died, Terah was still alive, and of course Abram was in midlife when Noah died. Do you imagine that with Abram? Do you think that Abram knew Noah? No. Nah. He had no clue. He didn't know Noah was still alive. How do we know that? He was in Ur the Chaldees, worshipping false gods, Joshua 24 verses 1 and 2 your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, they weren't crosses over he hadn't been called yet and he was in apostasy and God calls him out of apostasy 
So he can become a Hebrew across the road. He doesn't know Noah from a bar of soap. He doesn't know Shem either. But he meets him one day in the form of Melchizedek. Because Shem was the one who'd kept the fire burning, the light of the truth, while the rest of the world had turned to apostasy. So God had an ecclesia. He had an ecclesia. It was in Salem, right in the middle of the sons of Ham. Baal worshippers. Cush and Nimrod worshippers. That's what that means. So we're going to find how all of this is very, very interesting when you come to the rest of the Bible. Next interesting fact is that Eva, if you take Brother Thomas's chronology, overlived Abram by four years. Interesting, eh? Abram dies and Eva is still alive. Shem is the father of all the children of Eva. Another interesting fact. Shem dies 35 years after Abraham dies. So Melchizedek's still there when Abraham is laid in the cave of Machpelah. Interesting, eh? So when you look at the patriarchal line, it has a few things to say. When you think hard enough about it, you can see a divine design in these things. The hand of God is present. Now let's focus on this Peleg, the newborn baby of verse 25 of Genesis chapter 10. As we read there, in his days was the earth divided, and so he was named Peleg. The word means division. Strong suggests the division of an earthquake. Now this was the greatest political earthquake that had happened since the flood. Now the flood, of course, was accompanied by literal earthquakes as well, which reshaped the world as we know it today. It wasn't like that before. Reshaped the world. And we'll talk about that a little later on in terms of the tectonic plates. We know that the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So God moved continents. He did all sorts of things to bring water up from underneath, to bring this huge, catastrophic flood. Well, that was a great earthquake. Well, this was another one. This was the division of the tongue of man. Political earthquake which brought about consequences that have come down to our day. So it's interesting that this man's name, Peleg, division, relates to the division of an earthquake. The root word in the Hebrew comes from a a channel or a canal or a division. Now this name occurs seven times in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament obviously, and seven happens to be the covenant number. I wonder why God uses the name Peleg seven times. Well, it's about what he's doing in relation to his covenant. We're going to see that in a moment. It says, in his days was the earth divided. This word divided is badal signifies to divide by distinguishing or making a distinction. And it's used in these places in that regard. So God, in this time, when he divides the nations by confusing their tongue, is making a distinction. He's going to make a distinction between one class of people who are represented by a characteristic, their crosses over, and by others who follow the path of Nimrod whose tongue, whose religion is confused. Okay? That's what he's on about here. Well then, as you will recognise, the title for this session has come from this passage in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. Now, I'm not sure how much attention you give this verse, but it is one of the most critical passages in the Bible. Did you know that? One of the most critical passages in the Bible. You know why I can say that with confidence? Because Paul used it when he spoke on the Areopagus to the Greek philosophers and he used it for a very simple reason. His mind was back in Genesis chapter 14. When you read Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9, this is what it says. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance... Hang on, stop there, pause. What title would you have used? This is Deuteronomy 32. Ael occurs in that chapter several times. Eloah occurs in that chapter. Yahweh occurs in that chapter. 
Why use the title early on? Thought about that? When the most, what did he say? When Yahweh divided to the nations their inheritance. Again, you've got to ask yourself a question. Why? Well, you know why? The first time that that title early on was used in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14. Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, Ael, Aelion. And it's there four times. And Melchizedek's name means King of Righteousness. And four is the number of righteousness. And that chapter is about Armageddon, the setting up of the kingdom, the destruction of all opposition, and the rule of Christ in righteousness in a place called Salem, which is Jerusalem's name in the kingdom age. Psalm 76 verse 2 tells us that. That the Jeru part is taken off the name. Why? Because Jerusalem means the vision of peace. Not called that in the kingdom. It's called Salem because it is the repository of peace. No vision anymore. This is not something to hope for anymore. This will be a reality. So Melchizedek, king of righteousness, first king of righteousness, and then king of peace, king of Salem. Paul picks this up in Hebrews 7, doesn't he? So you see, when you start thinking about it, uh, what does it say about Abraham in that chapter? In verse 13, Genesis 14, verse 13, Abram the Hebrew. And Abram the Hebrew took a company of men consisting of home-born Hebrews, Jews, and converted Gentiles who were the owners or possessors of a covenant with him. They'd come into the truth by his preaching in Hebron for 20 years. And he takes this army against the northern confederacy who's come down upon the land of promise, defeated a southern confederacy of nations and taken away Abraham's natural brethren into captivity. The leader of this confederacy is called Kedileoma, which means a handful of sheaves. This is the first chapter in the Bible that deals with Armageddon. All right, and the setting up the kingdom. And when he comes back victorious with his company of Jewish and Gentile people, Melchizedek comes down and offers them bread and wine, the tokens of the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, beginning to understand why in Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 Yahweh says through Moses when the most high divided to the nations their inheritance what's Genesis 14 about? the total unwinding of what Nimrod accomplished in his rebellion and the establishment of the kingdom of God that's what it's about based on the work of Christ who Nimrod and his successors say they represent the vicar of God on the earth, the Pope, Nimrod's the first Pope, the Antichrist, thinks he's Christ on the earth. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. See what God uses that title for? He's not messing around. Takes you back to Genesis 14. Well, let's carry on. We've got the reason for the title. This is actually what happened in Genesis 10 and 11. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For Yahweh's portion is his people, and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. For how many children does Jacob have? How many sons has he got? Twelve. Hang on. I thought they were divided into seven. Isn't that what Genesis 10 said? That when God separated the sons of Adam, confused their tongue, in that was 70. Yes, that's what he said. And when Jacob came into Egypt, the record of Genesis 46, verse 27, tells us that Jacob had 70 sons and grandsons. So he starts with the number 12, that's his own personal sons. By the time he goes into Egypt, he has 70 progeny, 12 of his own sons, and whatever the rest is, 58, 58 grandsons, okay? For a total of 70. So it starts with 12, 
finishes with 70. Now these are vital numbers in the scheme of things, as we're going to see in a moment. 12 is the number of Israel, 70 is the number of the nations. Now, let's come back and have a look at Genesis chapter 10 verses 21 to 29. It says of Peleg in verse 25 that in his days was the earth divided and his brother's name was Joktan. And when you read down from verse 21, this is the list that is given to you of the progeny of Shem. It says in verse 21, unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the Hebrews, the brother of Japheth the order, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So here they are. Five sons of Shem listed. Who comes, who comes next? Verse 23. And the children of Aram, Uz and Hull and Githa and Mash. So Aram gets a mention as having children. He has one, two, three, four of them. Okay? And it says this. Verse 24. And Arphaxad begat Salah and Salah begat Eba. So our facts have has Salah and Salah has Eva. And when you add these up, excluding Shem for the time being, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Eva's number 11. So who's number 12? Well, Pelek. See in verse 25? For in his days was the earth divided. He's number 12. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam by confusing their tongues, he divided them according to the number of the children of Israel. Peleg. It happened in his day when he was born. Is number 12 in the list. Isn't that interesting? Now just hold that thought for a while. And look at the other side of the equation. On the other side, we have the children of Ham. And they're mentioned in the earlier part of chapter 10. There's Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Cain. Of course, Mizraim is the father of the Egyptians. Cush bears sons. Seba, Havilah, Saptar, Ramah, Saptakar, and of course, Nimrod. Ramah has Sheba and Bidam. <coughs> so what have we got here? We know that Nimrod is the 13th generation from Adam and he is the leader of the rebellion against Yahweh. He builds the, ta <clears throat> the tower which leads to the confusion, the tongue which happens when this boy is born. Okay? This is when the division of the earth occurs because of the rebellion of Nimrod. Now, Peleg has a brother. He's mentioned at the end of verse 25 of Genesis 10. And he, his brother's name was Joktan. So who is this Joktan? Well, we'll find out about him in a moment. But before we look at Joktan, who represents, by the way, the rebellious nations, and we'll see that very clearly, I just want you to step back. Just take one step back. And let's have a look at this whole equation from another perspective. Let's include Shem in the list. Let's start with Shem and work down the list we've just seen. Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram and his children, Salah, number 11 now, and Eva, number 12. Let's just leave Peeling out of the, the, the question for a, a while. And then let's have a, have a look at the list that is given to us in Genesis chapter 11 from verse 10 onwards. Now I'm not going to read all these names out, but this is the line of Shem down to Abram. Starts at verse 10 of chapter 11 and lists off the family of Shem, starting with Shem, his son Arphaxad, Arphaxad's son Salah, Salah's son Eba. Now this is where the division occurred. This is where Nimrod's rebellion led to the division of the nations into their 70. 
Peleg, Ru, Sirah, Nahor, Tirah, Abram's number 10, Isaac's number 11, oh, and Jacob is number 12. Isn't that interesting? Shem to Eva in the list given in chapter 10, which of course is not the line through which it all came. This is the line through which Abraham and ultimately Jacob came. Number 12 is Jacob. What's that telling us? It's telling us that 12 is the number of Israel. Jacob has 12 sons. These are the Hebrews that came from Shem. Just another way of illustrating that 12 is a very, very significant number in the divine scheme of things, as indeed is 70. Okay, let's come to Job 10. And we read about him in verses 26 to 29. It says, In Job 10 begat Almadad and Sheleph and Hazamabeth and, and the others. Job 10 is the 13th descendant of Shem listed. Okay? If Peleg is number 12, he's born when the earth's divided. Job 10 is number 13. Now, 13 is the number of rebellion, the biblical number for rebellion. You know, you've got statements like Genesis 14, verse 4. And they served Kedalaoma for 12 years, and in the 13th, they rebelled. You have statements like the Lord's in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 20. Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts. He lists them off. Guess how many? 13. And I could go on and on, demonstrate that 13 is the number of rebellion. Nimrod was the 13th generation of Adam. His name means we will rebel. Joktan was born after the division of the nations. His name means he will be made little. And his, new, his name has a numerical value, as all words do in the Hebrew and in the Greek. You can, you can actually add up the numerical value. Joktan's name has a numerical value of 169 which just happens to be 13 times 13, and this man has 13 sons. Accident? Don't think so. He has 13 sons, and the numerical value of his sons' names, put together in the aggregate, is 2,756, which just happens to be 212 times 13. Let me see what God's trying to say to us here. 12, the number of Israel. 70, the number of the rebellious nations because of Nimrod, the 13th generation from Adam. So this man, Joktan, who's stamped all over with 13, represents the rest of those nations, the rebellious nations. So what does God do when he separated the sons of Adam he divided them according to the number of the sons of Jacob. You know what he's saying to us, brothers and sisters? He's saying that he's going to reverse the rebellion of Nimrod and its effect through Israel, through Jacob, through Abraham. And that's why he calls Abram from the very heart of the worship of Nimrod. It starts with him. And when God's finished, he will have unwound the work of Nimrod completely. That's what he's telling us here in a remarkable way. 1270. So why are they important? Well, 12 is the number of Israel and 70 is the number of the nations. And the principle that God has used throughout history is to the Jew first and then the Gentiles. 1270. We know that. Have a look at Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Here is Israel that just left Marah, the bitterness of Marah. In Exodus 15, verse 27, we read this. And they came to Elam. Elam means mighty ones. So there's a vision of the kingdom before them. Where were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. I wonder why. This is a vision of the kingdom. 
Israel the centre, the first dominion, the 70 nations of mankind brought to Israel and ultimately absorbed into Israel, as we shall see. Those nations will disappear. And when God's finished, there will only be one nation left on the earth. And that will be the nation of Israel. He will have completely reversed what Nimrod accomplished. 12, 70. Does this work in the New Testament? Yes. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ sent forth 12 disciples to preach two by two to the Jew first. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, he sends forth 70 disciples two by two. What's that about? To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. See the structure of that? What about the apocalypse? In Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 to 8, we read that the perfected Israel, the redeemed, 12 tribes of 12,000, making up 144,000, stand all over with 12, isn't it? Just like Revelation 21. The city that comes down from God out of heaven stand all over with 12. But <coughs> well, what about Revelation 7 verse 9? It's the next verse after verse 8. What does that say? John beholds a great company that no man could number. There's an innumerable company. And what do they have in their hands? Palm branches. What does that mean? The palm is the symbol for the nations. Okay? So these are out of all nations and tongues and peoples. All peoples, see? Start with 12, finish with 7. God is going to bring the nations into Israel. And it's a very interesting fact that as a result of the flood, so say the geologists, and strongly suggested by the Bible, that there are 12 tectonic plates on the earth's crust. I wonder why 12? Oh, it could have been 13, I guess, couldn't it? It could have been 6, it could have been 8. Why 12? Here's the earth. There are 12 tectonic plates because 12 is the number of Israel. And all the nations reside on those 12 plates. And one day God's going to get them all into Israel. And he will unwind what Nimrod accomplished. He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? That's why twice in the prophecy of Jeremiah you have this statement made. In Jeremiah 30, verse 11, Though I make a full end of all nations, <coughs> he's speaking to Israel, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. In Jeremiah 46, verse 28, Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith Yahweh, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end. Now, a full end in my language is there's no more nations left. Is that the way you understand that? No nations. But there's one. <coughs> Though I make a full end of all nations, the 70 of Genesis 10, that came from Nimrod's rebellion, I will not make a full end of thee. Which means that Israel goes on forever. True? Twice he states that. I will not make a full end of thee. I have to correct you. You won't be left wholly unpunished. But you, Israel, will survive as a nation. Every other nation on earth will disappear. They will be absorbed into you. They'll all become Israelites. Part of the one nation. And I'll unwind what Nimrod did. That's what God's saying. So when we go back to this passage, it's very significant, isn't it? This is the plan of the Most High God. When he divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Twelve, and by extension, seventy. He's telling us that these seventy who came out of Nimrod's rebellion are going to be brought back to him via Israel. That's what he's going to do. And that's why he calls Abel. I called him alone, he says in Isaiah 51. Called him alone. Starts with one man. Builds from him a family which becomes a nation called Israel and invites the Gentiles to come into it. Those who don't are destroyed at Armageddon and beyond. 
He sends out the saints and eventually gets every single person that's come from Shem, Ham and Japheth into that one nation. And he's unwound. The rebellion of Nimrod. Now was this demonstrated to Israel? I want you to come to Numbers chapter 29. Numbers chapter 29. Which you'll all know is the detail of the Feast of Tabernacles. Starting at verse 12. We have the Feast of Trumpets from verse 1 to 6. We have the Day of Atonement from verse 7 to 11. And then from verse 12 of Numbers 29, we have the details of the offerings to be made on the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? And here they are. This is spelling it out. Now you can look at the detail in your, if you like. Day 1, verse 13. What do we read about day 1? First day of the feast. 15th day of the seventh month. It began, it says this. He shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of a Ooh, a sweet savour, a fragrance of rest. Unto Yahweh, thirteen young bullocks, two rams and fourteen lambs of the first year, they shall be without blemish. Now you read on to verse 17, you've got the second day. All of the details are the same, except for the number of the bullocks that were offered. The lambs and others, they're all the same. So the bullocks change. Day one, it's 13 bullocks. Day two, it's 12 bullocks. Day three, it's 11. Day four, 10. Day five, nine. Day six, eight. Day seven, seven bullocks. You don't need to be a mathematician. You add 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7, you come to 70. All right? Now these are the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Could I ask you what feast the nations will keep when they come up to Jerusalem to worship in the temple? Zechariah 14 verse 16. The Feast of Tabernacles. I wonder why. Well you see, there's a structure to this. There's a very great structure to it. Why does God start with 13, do you think? Who's the 13th generation from Adam that confused the religion of the world by apostasy? Nimrod. That's why he starts with 13. He's going to unwind him and destroy what Nimrod accomplished. So he starts with, where does he end? Well, he ends with seven. What's seven a number of? The Abrahamic covenant. And it speaks of the rest that God has in the seventh millennium. It's not hard to see the pattern, is it? Start with 13, the number of rebellion, and you end with the Abrahamic promise fulfilled. But that's only seven days or 7,000 years of human history, isn't it? The seventh day represents the Sabbath rest, doesn't it? When the Abrahamic promises are being fulfilled. But it's not finished. There was another day. You'll look at Numbers chapter 29, verses 35 and 36. 35 says, On the eighth day he shall have a solemn assembly. He shall do no servile work therein. Did you realise that this is the last holy convocation, the last special Sabbath, or if I can use our modern term, this is the last public holiday in Israel's year. This is only the seventh month. What about Thanksgiving and Christmas? <laughs> They're gone. They're not there. No public holidays. This is terrible. I'm just trying to you know, make it apparent that this is, this is an unusual feature, isn't it? The last holy convocation. We read on, verse 36. 
But ye shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savour, a fragrance of rest unto Yahweh. How many bullocks? One bullock. One ram. Seven lambs of the, of the first year without blemish. Why? Why one bullock? Well, if 70 bullocks represent 70 nations, and the seventh day represents the millennial period, and these nations during the millennium will come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, what happens at the end of the millennium? What happens in the eighth millennium when God is all and in all? Well, every single person on earth will be immortal and they'll all be members of one nation. There's only one nation left. That's the nation of Israel. So how many bullocks are you going to offer? One. One bullock representing the perfected nation of Israel. So when God instituted the Feast of Tabernacles, he was telling Israel that he had called them via Abraham from Ur the Chaldees, the very heart of Nimrudian worship. He built from Abram a nation through Jacob who had 12 sons. And now, in the kingdom age, they will be the first dominion, the principal dominion, because he's going to bring all those nations into the nation of Israel. And when he's finished, Nimrod is kaput. Nimrod is gone forever. And what he did back in Genesis 10 and 11, God will have unwound. And you see why I'm saying to you that no prophecy in the Bible doesn't have its roots. In Genesis 9, 12, we're going to see a bit more of that later on today. You know what this feast is called in John 7, 37? The Great day of the feast. Now it wasn't actually part of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was appended to it. Last holy convocation in Israel's religious year. It's called that great day of the feast. It's the time beyond the millennium when God will be all and in all and just one nation inhabits the earth. The nation of Israel. Tonight we'll have a look at the roots of Babylon the Great in the record of Genesis chapter 11.